In 2025, Earth is under alien occupation, with cities enclosed by 300-meter walls to restrict human movement. It's day 348 of the occupation. Amidst this turmoil, truck driver will bids farewell to his wife Katie and their children, Grayson and Bram. As he navigates the streets of Los Angeles patrolled by soldiers in red helmets, it becomes evident from his conversation with a colleague that Will is planning an illegal trip beyond the wall. He seeks out a smuggler who places him in a metal box and covers it with ice. During the journey, Will discovers a fellow passenger and confides in them about his quest to find his 12-year-old son left behind the wall. However, their journey takes a perilous turn when an explosion flips the truck over upon entering the gates. Dazed, Will manages to crawl out but is soon captured by the red helmet-wearing soldiers. Meanwhile, Katie embarks on her own dangerous mission, seeking forbidden insulin from an underground dealer. The invader's restrictions on medicine make it extremely challenging to obtain, but Katie persists. However, she faces setbacks when the insulin she acquires turns out to be spoiled. Armed with a pistol, she fights her way out, risking detection by drones and potential death. Despite the danger, Katie is determined to secure the medication for her family. As Will languishes in prison, unable to contact his wife, Katie grapples with worry and uncertainty. Her concern deepens when her sister Maddie arrives with her son, who also requires insulin. Promising to find the medication, Katie seeks assistance from her husband's colleague, who denies knowledge of Will's whereabouts. The situation escalates when an alarm blares over the city, adding to Katie's anxiety. Despite her efforts, she returns home empty-handed, only to face further challenges and dangers in the occupied city. Katie finds refuge under a military truck parked at the curb, narrowly escaping detection by a hovering drone. Just as she fears being discovered, the truck unexpectedly starts moving, allowing her to safely return home. The next morning, she confides in her friend Broussard about Will's disappearance. Broussard reveals that, like her husband, Will was formerly with the FBI. He urged Katie to return home while he contacted his remaining contacts. Ignoring his advice, Katie heads to the hospital, where she learns of the explosion at the city's entrance. Amidst the chaos, she resorts to stealing several vials of insulin from a store. Meanwhile, in prison, Will listens to his cellmate's confessions as he awaits his fate. Soon, he learns that he will be sent to work at a factory for the aliens. However, his situation takes a surprising turn when soldiers arrive, recognizing him by his real surname. They escort him to the Green Zone, where he meets Snyder, a representative of the Los Angeles governor. Snyder is aware of Will's military and FBI background, recognizing his expertise in apprehending dangerous criminals. With the military and police gone since the aliens' arrival, Will had no choice but to conceal himself. Now, Snyder offers him a deal, in exchange for his family's protection, Will must lead a special unit to infiltrate the rebels and capture their leader, Jono. As the alien spacecraft prepares to launch, Snyder attempts to persuade Will to switch sides, taking him to the balcony to discuss their plans further. Refusal means his family will be sent to the factory. At night, the Red Helmets return Will home, startling his family. He reassures them, claiming he was in an accident. However, Katie senses her husband's deception. Learning he went to search for Charlie, she breaks down in tears. The proposal from Snyder further infuriates her, she refuses to be the spouse of a traitor. The next morning, the family is awakened by the aroma of bacon. In the kitchen, they discover Snyder, who has prepared breakfast and even managed to brew coffee, a rare commodity. As he eats, Snyder outlines the advantages of their new arrangement, security, a private tutor for the children, quality meals, and employment. Additionally, the aliens permit the couple to reopen their old bar. However, Will's consent is contingent upon the return of his son, who is in another block. Snyder agrees to consider this condition. The following day, Katie visits an inconspicuous house where members of the resistance gather. She informs them that the occupiers have enlisted her husband to locate them. The next morning Will heads to work, only to realize that Snyder deceived him. Instead of leading a special unit, he finds himself under the command of Phyllis, tasked with locating the individual responsible for planting an explosive device at the city entrance. He is partnered with Bo, a former policeman. Meanwhile, Katie arrives at her bar and stumbles upon her missing son's belongings. Broussard interrupts her cleaning, eager to learn what information the police have gathered regarding the explosion at the customs. However, Will has just commenced his new assignment and lacks any details. Meanwhile, Will and Bo approach the residence of the wanted criminal's girlfriend. Employing deception, they compel him to flee through the back door. They apprehend him shortly after, but their capture is interrupted by the sudden appearance of a drone. Fearlessly, Will stares directly into its lens, causing it to vanish instantly. At the station, the detainee is brought in, where they encounter Will's arrested colleague. The man pleads with Phyllis to release him in exchange for information, but she refuses. Later, Will returns to his trailer, only to find his family absent. 
Simultaneously, Katie arrives at the house with the woman and child seeking refuge. After hiding them upstairs, Katie heads to Broussard's for assistance in acquiring new documents. However, he declines, citing the resistance's aversion to risks. Disappointed, Katie confronts Will at home, who, upon learning about their presence, agrees to take them to a forger. Along the way, they encounter the Red Helmets, who, after inspecting their pass, apologize and allow them to proceed, leaving Katie in disbelief. They reach the master's residence, where Will arranges for the fabrication of the documents. He reassures Katie that he has apprehended the individual responsible for the bombing and assures her that once they locate Jono, they can bring Charlie back. Later, Will escorts the woman and child to a displaced person's camp. Meanwhile, Katie meets with Alexander, the leader of the resistance, who assures her that the boy apprehended by Will belongs to another faction but pledges to warn them at the station. Will discovers that a group of prisoners is being prepared for transport to the factory. Phyllis advises him to resign himself to the situation, citing the city's weakened defense, destroyed in just eight hours. What could a handful of rebels accomplish during the night? Katie consoles her husband when he receives news that the suspect has disclosed his accomplice's whereabouts. Will departs, prompting Katie to hurriedly phone Broussard to warn him. Simultaneously, the prisoners are taken to a location, stripped, disinfected, and then reclothed. However, the Red Helmets, upon reaching the location disclosed by the detainee, discover only the bodies of rebels, leading Will to suspect a spy within the police force. The following morning, a man with a cart enters a nondescript house on the outskirts of Los Angeles, initiating a radio broadcast calling for the overthrow of the occupation, led by Jono. Detecting the transmission, the Red Helmets head to the location. Meanwhile, Bram duplicates the broadcast recording and conceals the cassettes under the bed. However, when the military storms the house, they find it empty. On the same day, Katie participates in a resistance operation targeting a food truck. Tragically, one of their comrades, Kim, is mortally wounded during the attack. Katie attempts to assist him, but Broussard intervenes and ends the boy's suffering, leaving Katie deeply unsettled. Soon, drones arrive, indiscriminately firing upon passersby. Despite the chaos, Broussard calculates the authorities' response time to the incident. Following the operation, Katie rushes home, barely managing to wash away the traces of blood. She is so shaken that she refuses to explain anything and locks herself in her room. Meanwhile, at school, Bram hands a cassette to his teacher, who notices a shift in the pattern of the alien ship's takeoffs. He had observed a large object circling Earth in the sky and now plans to construct a more powerful telescope. At the scene of the incident, the police arrive. Will notices the body of a boy who appears to have been intentionally finished off. Phyllis orders a photo to be taken of the victim and swiftly identifies him. Subsequently, the Red Helmets proceed to his house and apprehend his parents. Outraged by this turn of events, Will fails to notice Broussard in the crowd. Broussard heads to the resistance base and reports the incident to Alexander, who remains confident that Kim left no trace. Later, Will returns home, where Katie explains her morning behavior, revealing the items found in their son's bar. Distraught, Will blames himself for his perceived powerlessness against the masters, but Katie assures him of her support. Subsequently, Katie meets with Broussard, who justifies his actions as saving Kim from potential torture. However, now they must extract any information Will acquired during the investigation from him. Meanwhile, Bram's friend seeks his help, leading him to an underground tunnel beneath the wall, where her brother sustained a leg injury. T turns out their father had worked there before the arrival of the aliens, and now they utilize the tunnel to venture beyond the wall. Will and Bo investigate a cultural center listed among the places visited by the deceased Kim and stumble upon a rebel weapons cache. Meanwhile, Bram's friends reveal to him that they have been crossing to the other side for six months to procure food, as there is no one beyond the wall. Upon learning about the lost weapons, Alexander tasks Broussard with warning Katie about the unacceptable nature of her husband's actions. Broussard conveys this message, but Katie remains more concerned about her family's safety. Nonetheless, she opens the bar to visitors in the evening. Suddenly, amidst the festivities, Snyder arrives. He congratulates everyone on the opening of the establishment and then explains to Will that by revitalizing such places, the masters enable people to release tension safely. This infuriates Katie, who believes they have compromised their principles to appease the aliens in exchange for their son's return. However, Will remains convinced that by continuing to work for Snyder, he will eventually locate Charlie. Later, he discusses the matter with Bo once more, expressing his suspicions about a potential spy. However, Bo, who has experienced betrayal firsthand, is skeptical about such a possibility. Meanwhile, Katie confides in Broussard, revealing that the rapid discovery of the Resistance's hideouts is likely facilitated by a woman with access to a vast database. She is willing to disclose her name if it ensures Will's safety. Broussard pledges to honor this agreement. 
The following day, a squad of red helmets storms into the school, brutally arresting a teacher and assaulting a student. Upon returning to the base, one of the soldiers removes his helmet, revealing himself to be Broussard. He later informs Alexander that he has acquired the duty schedule of the Red Helmets, providing them with an opportunity to be in the right place at the right time. Simultaneously, Phyllis shows Will information about the Los Angeles rebels, suggesting that if they unite and launch an offensive, the entire block could be cleared out. She emphasizes the significance of this to Will and his family, hoping for his loyalty. Meanwhile, Katie takes the children for a walk with Lindsay, the governor appointed by the authorities, and activates a prearranged signal by turning on a street light. Upon hearing the sound of breaking glass, she counts to ten before deploying a fire extinguisher. Only after extinguishing the fire does she call emergency services. Both the red helmets and Will arrive at the scene. Will is infuriated to find his house being searched, but it's standard protocol. Katie is then summoned for interrogation by Phyllis. She is promised enhanced security for her family, and the neighbors are warned that they will be held accountable if any harm befalls them. Katie is taken aback by the realization that they will now be feared by those around them. Phyllis probes Katie about various aspects, including the personal dynamics between husband and wife. In the meantime, Maddie seeks employment at the Commission for the Preservation of Cultural and Artistic Items and introduces herself to Charlotte, the director, hoping to secure a position as her assistant. Following his wife's interrogation, Will confronts Phyllis, who presents him with tapes discovered under Bram's bed and advises him to keep a closer watch on his son. She decides to retain these pieces of evidence for the time being. Enraged, Will drives home, and after a difficult conversation, Bram reveals posters to his father. Their appearance in the city signifies the release of a new broadcast by Jono. Katie manages to extract a promise from Alexander not to harm her husband and, in return, identifies Phyllis, her husband's superior, in a photograph. Later, another broadcast by Jono begins in the city, prompting immediate detection by the police, who rush to the library. Although the man is arrested, Will assures them it's not Jono, greatly disappointing Snyder, who had already informed the masters of their assumed victory. On the same day, Maddie witnesses Charlotte's frustration when she requires a painting by a specific artist. Maddie offers her knowledge of the city's art collections, having previously worked as an art historian. Meanwhile, during interrogation, the arrested man confesses that he found the broadcast text in a pipeline. The police verify the location, leading to the discovery that the pipe connects to the green zone. Charlotte's team discovers art items in the house mentioned by Maddie. In gratitude, the owner offers her a position and promises assistance with insulin. Phyllis later informs Will that, as a gesture of trust, she has destroyed the tapes. Upon returning home, Bram admits to listening to Jono because he was the only one offering hope to people. Katie arrives at the bar earlier than usual and finds Phyllis waiting for her, eager to speak in private. Phyllis discusses Katie's husband, drawing parallels with Will, who seems blinded by his love for his wife, unable to see her true nature. She presents surveillance photos from the site of the truck attack, cautioning Katie that she has associated herself with the wrong crowd. If Katie wishes to ensure her survival, Phyllis asserts, she must now work for her. After their conversation, Phyllis returns home to her paralyzed husband. Despite her initial greeting, upon entering the living room, she encounters Broussard. Phyllis immediately discerns his purpose and requests that he dispatch her husband as well. Broussard obliges pulling the trigger. The following day, Bo and Will investigate the crime scene, discovering the word Egono is scrawled on the wall. Snyder is incensed by Phyllis's proximity to the masters and demands swift apprehension of the perpetrator. A report comes in regarding the capture of a member of the Jono group. Will interrogates the young man who provides an address within the green zone. Red helmets storm the location, uncovering a concealed room and several individuals identifying themselves as the Gono group. Meanwhile, Bram, accompanied by his girlfriend, traverses beneath the wall and finds themselves in an abandoned city, where they locate essential provisions within a vast warehouse. Upon their return to Los Angeles, news spreads of the supposed eradication of the underground, though Will remains skeptical. Snyder's frustration mounts further upon observing that the detained couple bears no resemblance to terrorists. He reneges on the agreement regarding the search for Charlie and appoints Will as the leader of the group. Will promptly initiates a hunt for the mole, prompted by Phyllis's assistant Jennifer, who insinuates that Will's wife may be the source of the leak. Upon returning home, Will catches Bram in the act of giving his sister markers brought from beyond the wall, but Bram fabricates a story, claiming he traded them for oranges. Meanwhile, Snyder interrogates a man who purported to be Jono, only to discover he's merely an actor. Snyder strikes a deal with him, persuading him to continue playing the role in exchange for relocation to another block. Simultaneously, Bram rushes to his teacher, pledging to procure a potent lens for his telescope. 
Will conducts a covert search of the bar, unbeknownst to his wife, but uncovers nothing incriminating aside from a book unfamiliar to him. The trial of Gono is broadcast across all channels, showcasing relatives of terrorism victims, and a scaffold for execution is erected in the square. Despite initially believing Snyder's promises to eradicate terrorism, the actor portraying Gono realizes he's been deceived when he finds himself facing the scaffold, powerless to change his fate. Following the execution, Snyder extends an invitation to Will, promising to unveil something extraordinary. Meanwhile, Alexander's group readies for a fresh assault, with Katie among the rebels. En route, Will expresses his disdain to Snyder for achieving nothing with the actor's execution. However, Snyder reminds him of the necessity to pacify the populace and buys time to hunt down the real Gono. Snyder's car traverses the city under the watchful eye of a group of red helmets, including Broussard. As they navigate a bend in the road, a decoy road worker diverts them onto a detour. Seizing the opportunity, Broussard opens fire on his colleagues. Snyder attempts to flee, but Will secures the doors, knowing the car is armored. Disguised rebels, clad in red helmets uniforms, shoot at the vehicle and manage to wrench a door off. Despite firing from inside, Will successfully extricate Snyder from the peril. Drones swarm overhead, but the rebels evade capture. Will guide Snyder into the bar, coinciding with Katie's arrival. Snyder, in a state of hysteria, finds no solace in Will's assurances of protection. In private, Katie implores Will not to jeopardize himself for someone so undeserving, but Will cannot abandon someone in need. Realizing the phone is dead, he ventures outside to a pay phone to summon backup. Meanwhile, Alexander, upon learning of Will's intervention to save Snyder, erupts in anger. However, Katie communicates via radio that Treyer is inside the bar. She engages Snyder in conversation to lower his guard. Snyder brags about his background as an economics professor, which elevated him to a position of authority. He divulges information about seven other colonies but admits ignorance regarding their circumstances. Will returns, announcing he's called for reinforcements, which are en route. Katie tends to Will's wound Ave image. Katie pleads not to intervene in Snyder's execution, but Will reminds her that someone else will simply take his place. Suddenly, there's a knock on the door. They hastily conceal Snyder in the bathroom. Broussard enters disguised in a red helmet's uniform and conducts a thorough search. Katie leads him to the basement, urging him to ensure Will's safety, although he cannot guarantee anything given Will's propensity for getting involved. Eventually, Broussard departs, but Will is convinced he's a member of the resistance and will return with reinforcements. They fortify the doors with Snyder, who once again mentions Charlie, provoking Katie's ire as she's weary of his manipulation. Meanwhile, the rebels attempt to breach the bar but are unsuccessful. A frightened Snyder informs Will that the Masters have tested nearly every individual, filtering out those deemed unnecessary, but he himself has never encountered the aliens. As the rebels intensify their assault, Will instructs Katie to hide, preparing to defend Snyder. Amidst the chaos of a smoke grenade detonation and the militant onslaught, Will opens fire. When a rebel locates Will, Katie shoots him, only for Broussard to aim at her. Will implores her to relinquish the weapon. The rebel herds them into the basement and departs. However, Will discovers a machine gun and gives chase, but upon reaching the upper floor, finds the assailants have vanished. Subsequently, the genuine red helmets arrive and extract Snyder from the closet where Will had concealed him. In the evening, Will endeavors to reassure Katie, explaining that Snyder's trial was a sham. There is no champion of the people, and those who attack them have no affiliation with Gono. Meanwhile, Alexander deduces that Katie is a double agent, merely stringing them along. Concurrently, Maddie initiates a relationship with Nolan, Charlotte's husband, who leads the New Age Preacher Church. Simultaneously, Will identifies Broussard from a photo, having spotted him among the assailants, and receives orders to locate and apprehend him. The Red Helmets proceed to his address, but as they prepare to breach the house, it explodes. Will interrogates Broussard's comrades, one of whom mentions a distinctive feature, a chest tattoo, recognized by Will as a special forces insignia. Broussard infiltrates a restricted zone, where he absconds with the corpse of a dark-skinned man of similar age and build. Together with Alexander, they place it in a vehicle and set it ablaze. Throughout, Alexander persuades Broussard of Katie's treachery. Later, the authorities discover a burnt car with a charred body inside, matching the description of the bar attacker, yet Will once again harbors doubts. Katie attempts to contact the underground but struggles to do so. Eventually, she locates an encrypted message indicating a meeting point where a car driven by Broussard awaits her. Meanwhile, Will's assistant Jennifer uncovers 14 individuals resembling Broussard in the database, leading Will to realize that Broussard is not merely a military operative but a former FBI agent. Card escorts Katie out of the city and poses challenging questions, given that she shot one of her own. However, Katie reiterates her initial condition, her family must remain unharmed. 
She asserts her steadfast commitment to the cause but faces doubts about her allegiance, prompting her to depart, unwilling to entertain further discussion. Broussard confides in one of the resistance members, Rachel, revealing Alexander's directive to eliminate Katie and his own inability to carry it out. Meanwhile, we'll visit Snyder in the Green Zone, reporting on Broussard's deceptive communication and acknowledging his formidable skills. However, he reassures Snyder that Broussard will be apprehended. In response, Snyder hands him an envelope containing a recent photo of Charlie. Will delivers it to Katie, who tearfully implores her husband to free themselves from Snyder's control. He pledges to do so when the time is right. In the meantime, Charlotte discovers Maddie's relationship with Nolan and threatens to terminate her employment. Nolan, however, asserts his authority and offers Maddie a position as his assistant. Armed with new information, the police summon Will, who returns home to share with his wife a photo of Broussard and the revelation that his fingerprints were found in their bar. Katie initially denies knowing him, but when Will shows her images of his victims, she recalls Broussard's visit, during which he claimed to reside in his mother's home and work on renovations. Jennifer swiftly tracks down Broussard's mother's house using receipts from construction stores. Meanwhile, Rachel approaches Katie, admitting Broussard's involvement in numerous killings, albeit as recalling her own near-victimization, confronts Rachel, who defends Broussard's restraint in sparing her life. Concerned for Broussard's safety, Katie alerts him to Will's discovery. As the Red Helmets converge on Broussard's mother's residence, they find it deserted, with abandoned tools indicating his escape. Will encounters a neighbor, later revealed to be Alexander, who denies any knowledge of Broussard's whereabouts. However, Will notices a familiar book on Broussard's table, akin to the one found in Katie's bar. Meanwhile, Will's partner investigates a factory where workers frequently fall ill or perish, only to discover that these factories are situated on the moon. Will shares a photo of Charlie with his children, confessing his government employment was solely to reunite with his son. Elsewhere, the governor of the Los Angeles block visits Snyder's, assuring him of smooth operations despite her evident skepticism. Katie seeks counsel from Rachel, discovering her underage son's involvement in the resistance. While impressed by Rachel's bravery, Katie decides to withdraw from the group to safeguard her family, though Rachel pledges ongoing support. In a twist, Alexander contacts Will, accusing Katie of being the mole within their ranks and arranging a rendezvous. Will attends the meeting where he confronts Broussard's neighbor, who confesses to leading the cell and offers to betray his comrades in exchange for freedom from the block. In the meantime, Broussard rendezvous with the leader of the youth rebel cell, obtaining intel about the impending arrival of a significant figure. Will updates Broussard on recent developments before approaching Snyder to convey Alexander's terms, prompting Snyder to request a face-to-face -face meeting. Later, during an evening conversation, Katie revisits the topic of Charlie's whereabouts, questioning why Snyder can't facilitate his return if he knows his location. However, the focus shifts to the impending meeting with Alexander, who expresses willingness to betray the entire cell. Sensing danger, Katie discreetly signals Broussard at the bar. Meanwhile, Bram and his teacher observe peculiarities on the moon's surface, indicating potential alien mining and storage facilities. That night, Broussard arrives at the bar, where Katie divulges the leader's treachery. He promptly confronts Alexander, but the latter insists on severing ties with Katie and prepares for a new operation. The following day, Will escorts Snyder to the rendezvous with Alexander, who confesses his desire for survival and seeks a universal pass for interblock travel. In exchange, he offers intelligence on Broussard's group, acknowledging their plot to eliminate the minister. Alexander arranges a meeting for Broussard, intending for the police to apprehend him. Subsequently, Will pledges to escort Alexander beyond the wall in exchange for the pass. Later, Broussard arrives at the designated market rendezvous. Rachel and Katie join him, and upon spotting the red helmets, Katie promptly alerts Broussard. Amidst the chaos caused by a rebel igniting firecrackers, panic ensues, and gunfire erupts from the military, tragically resulting in Rachel's death. Broussard manages to evade capture. Meanwhile, Will confronts Alexander at his heavily guarded residence, revoking the deal with Snyder. However, Snyder's attempt to incriminate Katie seals his fate, leading Will to fatally shoot him, pinning the blame on Broussard. As night falls, Rachel's family is found hanged, prompting Katie to pledge her support to Broussard. Will subtly acknowledges his awareness of Katie's involvement in the resistance. During the subsequent night, a spontaneous uprising erupts, resulting in the deaths of several red helmets. Bo asserts that the populace's patience has worn thin. Will informs Snyder about intelligence regarding a new rebel faction located beyond the wall, hinting at the existence of an undisclosed passage to the authorities. Seeking permission to investigate further, Snyder agrees but assigns them a guard. 
Meanwhile, Broussard and Katie meet with the leader of the youth cell, who proposes a joint assault on the minister, to be executed within the underground subway, now exclusively utilized by the masters. Venturing beyond the wall, Will and Bo scale a skyscraper to survey the cityscape before staging a faux attack on themselves, prompting their guard to investigate. Discovering a supposedly lost map left behind by the assailants, their commander scrutinizes the findings. Subsequently, Will highlights to Snyder the strategic markings on the map denoting the rebels' intended targets. Snyder reports the discovery of a tunnel beneath the wall. Broussard instructs Katie on shooting techniques. Meanwhile, Red Helmets, under Snyder's command, raid Nolan's residence, accusing Charlotte of concealing valuable paintings from the masters and apprehending her. That night, Katie discovers a book promoting the benefits of the arrival given to her daughter by Lindsay. Disturbed by the indoctrination of children by the new church, she urgently contacts Will to share her concerns. Will, in response, reveals their imminent relocation to Bo's residence beyond the wall, accusing Katie of spying on him. Overwhelmed by the constant deceit between them, Katie insists that hiding, even beyond the wall, is futile. They decide that Bo should flee alone. Subsequently, Katie and Broussard eliminate guards, infiltrate the subway, and open a secondary entrance for the group's ingress. The rebels orchestrate an explosion, derailing the train. Amidst the wreckage, they discover the body of an alien. Will receives word of this development and rushes to the station, where the governor soon arrives, declaring the abduction of a master. Recalling a previous incident resulting in the destruction of Dallas after the demise of two aliens, the governor issues a stern warning to Los Angeles about the repercussions if the missing master is not found. Meanwhile, a rebel faction transports the alien to a clandestine location, utilizing metallic foil to block signals. Will rushes home and instructs Maddie to hide the children, considering taking them to the green zone. He attempts to locate Katie and Bram, providing Bram with a secret number his mother received the previous day. Meanwhile, as rebels endeavor to relocate the alien, an unexpected daytime curfew is imposed. Maddie and the children find themselves in a massive queue, with chaos ensuing as they attempt to navigate through it, resulting in Bram fleeing. Concurrently, rebels seize a red helmet's vehicle and load the alien into it. Police receive footage from subway cameras, with Will recognizing Katie but keeping it to himself. Bram seeks refuge with his teacher, leading him to the tunnel. Elsewhere, the group transporting the alien utilizes a commandeered police car, witnessing a house being fired upon to instill fear in the populace. Snyder is ousted from his position, leaving the governor powerless. The alien is transported to a secluded laboratory, where attempts are made to breach its suit. Will entrusts the rebel codebook to Jennifer, and together they analyze operation footage from Broussard's arrest attempt, identifying the youth cell leader in the process. The rebels manage to activate the communicator on the alien's wrist. Will confronts Katie's group, urging them to surrender the alien and flee for their safety. However, Katie opts to defy his demands, prompting the rebels to escape through a concealed passage just as drones converge on the house. Katie eventually opens the door, and Will contacts the authorities, resulting in the alien's apprehension. Snyder expresses gratitude by providing Will with a universal pass for passage beyond the wall. Meanwhile, Bram and his teacher are intercepted in the tunnel by the police. Snyder is apprehended by a patrol. Will ventures beyond the wall in search of his son, while Katie returns to a desolate home, marking the conclusion of the first season.